Well, open your Bibles with me this morning to Philippians chapter 3 as we continue our series of studies through this book called Outrageous Joy. Outrageous Joy. And as we study this letter, we're focusing on those principles that can help us maintain an attitude of joy during difficult circumstances. And throughout this chapter, Paul urges the believers in Philippi to stay focused on Jesus Christ. That's what the whole chapter is about, staying focused on Jesus Christ. Now, before we move on and begin looking at the next section of this chapter, let me remind you of where we are in our outline for this chapter. In verses 1 and 3, if you remember, Paul focuses on the person of Christ In verses 2 through 11, which is the longest section of this chapter, and we finished up on Easter Sunday, Paul focuses focuses on the provision of Christ. And now as we come to verses 12 through 16, Paul focuses us here on the perfection of Christ. The perfection of Christ. And so that's what we're going to begin looking at today, is verses 12 through 16. Now, as we begin our study here in verse 12, or as we begin our study here in verse 12, I want you to notice that immediately after Paul informs the Philippians of his certainty of becoming like Christ one day at the future resurrection when Christ comes again, he now brings them back to the present. And notice in verses 2 through 14 what he says here. Look at your Bibles, verse 12. Paul says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, And reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Here in verses 12 through 14, right after sharing about partaking in Christ's perfection in the future, Paul discusses the process of Christ-likeness now. That's what these verses are about. In 12, especially 12 through 14, but 12 through 16, Paul is now going to begin to discuss the process of Christ-likeness in us presently or now. In verse 12, notice that Paul here, he confesses something. Look at verse 12. He says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected. Now, even though... Future perfection or complete Christ-likeness is one of the gains or assets of knowing Christ. It's not something that Paul attained to. Uh, The word attain there means to take possession of. Or it's also not something that any believer will ever attain to in this life. Now, I know there are a lot of people who think that they have attained to perfection, or at least they're the closest thing that you can get to it. But let me tell you, they're all deceived. They're liars. Because not even the Apostle Paul attained to perfection in this life, and neither will any of us. So let's just get that clear right now, out in the open. All right? The word perfected here is from the same Greek word that is translated as mature down in verse 15. See down in verse 15? Paul uses the word mature. Uh, Some of your Bibles, if it says perfect, that's what it means. It means mature. So when Paul speaks of perfection in this section, he's not referring to sinless perfection in this life, nor is he referring to the Christ-likeness that we will possess in the next life, but rather he's referring to spiritual maturity 
And he confesses that personally, for himself, he's not there yet. Wow. Paul says he has not attained that yet. Now just imagine that, okay? At the time Paul is writing this letter, he's in prison for his testimony of Christ, and it's been over 30 years since he came to Christ. He's been a Christian now for over 30 years. He traveled all over the Mediterranean preaching and planting churches. And by this time, he's already written most of the New Testament. Okay? What have you done? Listen, with all that he had accomplished for Christ and all that Christ had accomplished through him, he still felt as if he had some growing to do. Boy, does that not make you feel humble? Now, why did Paul feel this way? Why did Paul feel this way? He felt this way because he used Christ as his canon, not other Christians. He used Christ as his standard, his rule of measurement, not other people. In fact, Paul warned against this very thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. He told the Corinthians that it wasn't wise to compare ourselves with one another or use others as our standard of measurement. Now, why not? I'll tell you why. Because it's very deceptive. It's very deceptive. See, when we compare our spiritual progress with that of others, or we measure our spirituality to that of others, we have the tendency to lower the bar. Do we not? Yeah, we lower the bar how? By choosing people that we know aren't as mature as we are. And we compare ourselves to them. And when we do, we say, hey, I'm doing pretty good. See, we usually look for those who aren't as mature as we are or are not as far along in their relationship with the Lord as we are. And as a result, we believe that we're more than we are and thus we deceive ourselves. See? Always remember that from God's perspective, Christ is the standard. In fact, in Romans chapter 2, Paul makes it very clear and says that one day God is going to judge the secrets of the heart of men by Christ Jesus, not one another. See? So, it is a deceptive thing for us to compare ourselves with ourselves, to measure ourselves with others among us when the standard before God is actually Jesus Christ. If you want to know where you're at with God, don't measure yourself to me. Don't measure yourself to someone else in this church or another believer. Measure yourself to Jesus. And I'm sure if you do that, you will find the same thing Paul found. I got a lot of growing to do. I got a lot of maturing to do. See? And when it came to knowing Christ and becoming like Christ, Paul knew that he had merely scratched the surface. Okay? In fact, the New Testament reveals the more, the more Paul knew of Christ, the more he actually learned about himself which then gave him the more reason to grow. Let me give it to you. For instance, about 20 years after his conversion, Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 15, 9. He wrote to the Corinthians and said, I am the least of the apostles. I'm the least. And then about seven years later, Paul wrote in Ephesians 3, 8, 
and said this. He said, to me, who am less than the least of all saints. And then a few years later after that, Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.15 and said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Did you notice the progression? The longer Paul walked with the Lord, the more he learned of Christ the more he learned of himself and the more humble he became because he realized that he had not yet arrived. He had not yet attained perfection or obtained maturity compared to Jesus. See, See, the more Paul compared himself to his contemporaries the better he looked, right? Case in point, okay? Verses 5 and 6 of this chapter, right? Paul gives us his credentials. Paul gives to us everything that he looks at as gains, assets, or profits in his relationship to God. And when you compare that list with his contemporaries, Paul was... Head and shoulders above everyone else. Until he met Jesus. And all of a sudden, what's he say next? I count all of those gains now to be one gigantic loss. See? Isn't it amazing? So, compared to his contemporaries, he looked better. He looked good. But the more he compared himself to Christ, the more growing he had to do. See? And if it was true of Paul, then how much more is it true of us? Right? I mean, my goodness. So as we learn these things, it should bring us to a point of humility and to a point of realizing that we haven't arrived to the spiritual maturity that God desires for us either. In fact, it's been said, the largest room in the world is the room for improvement. And it's true. Never forget that. Because I believe if we would remember that and what we're learning here, it would, it would change a whole lot for some of us when it comes to how we treat one another, how we deal with one another. See? Now, here's what I want you to know. This is important. In the New Testament, there are three stages of perfection mentioned. Three stages of perfection. Number one, there's positional perfection. There's progressive perfection. And then there's perpetual perfection. Positional, progressive, and perpetual. Now, let me explain this to you. Through justification, through God declaring that the guilty sinner is no longer guilty through his faith in Christ, that's justification. Through justification, we are positionally perfect in God's sight. At the moment we put our faith in Christ, at the moment we're born again, God looks at us as perfect. See, that's why He can put up with you. Because once you're in Christ, who does He now see? Exactly. We've talked about that in past studies, right? So there's positional perfection. That happens at the moment we're born again. Hebrews 10, 14 says this. It says, For by one offering He, Jesus, has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. He has perfected us through what He has done on the cross. He's perfected us forever when we put our faith in Him. Isn't that good news? Wow. 
That means, guess what? I don't have to impress God. That means I don't have to try to appease Him or to impress Him because He's already appeased and impressed by what His Son did on our behalf. And when I put my faith in Jesus, I'm now in Christ, and so that's how He views me. And you need to understand that. You need to grab a hold of that. You need to believe that and then allow that to be a truth that affects how you live and how you think about yourself and about Him. Number two, then through sanctification, we are progressively being made perfect or mature. Sanctification is that process where the Holy Spirit uses God's Word in our life in order to make us holy. Okay? And so, through sanctification, we are being progressively made perfect or mature. And progressive means it's a process. That process is not going to end until you see Jesus. Okay? So understand that. That's important to understand. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 says this, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That is what the Holy Spirit is interested in doing in your life as a believer. Perfecting you, making you mature by purging you and cleansing you of all the filthiness of flesh and spirit and bringing you to a place where you become more and more like Jesus. That's sanctification. So that is progressive perfection. And then, and actually let me say this, that perfection there is the perfection that Paul is talking about in our text here, okay, in Philippians 3. This is what Paul is actually referring to. And finally, through glorification, one day we will be made perpetually perfect. Okay? One day when Jesus comes and resurrects the dead believers and catches away the believers who are alive at that time in the rapture, we're going to receive our new bodies, which we talked about last week. We're going to share in the glory of Christ. And we are going to to enter then into His perfection for eternity. Okay? And 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. I want you to listen to this. Paul writes and says this, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. In other words, right now, in this life, in these bodies, in this world, everything is partial. We're not, we don't know as we should, and we're not all that we should be. And then he goes on to say this, But when that which is perfect has come, that which is perfect has come, who's that? Or what is that? Literally, it's Christ. When Christ comes, He will then usher His people into the eternal state, which is perfection. And that's what perfect is talking about here. It's talking about the eternal state of perfection. When that has come, guess what? Then that which is in part will be done away. See? Everything we lack now will be gone. Why? Because we will be like Christ in that day for eternity. See? And that's perpetual perfection. And so again... Just like our redemption or our salvation. Perfection is past, it's present, and it's future. See? And it's important to understand that. Now, I like how George Mueller described Christian perfection. He said this. He said, just as a little child is a perfect human being but still is far from perfect in his development as man. So the true child of God is also perfect in all parts, although not yet perfected in all stages of his development 
in faith. That really sums up perfection very well. Very well. And because of that, Paul confessed that he personally was still a work in progress and that he possessed what Warren Wearsby called a divine dissatisfaction. Paul was not satisfied with his development. He wasn't satisfied with his maturity. And that's what he's telling us in our text. Now listen, it is important. It is important to possess a certain amount of dissatisfaction in our spiritual lives. Okay? Because just like Paul, none of us have attained or are already perfected. Though we are completely satisfied with our Savior, with Jesus, okay? And even though God is completely satisfied with us in Christ, it is important for us never to become satisfied with where we are at because if we do, what will happen is we will then become again self-deceived and what that will do is stunt our spiritual growth and our spiritual progress. The Christian who thinks, you know what, I've come a long way, baby. I don't know what else there is to fix. I'm pretty much perfect. Jesus has fixed it all. Is a person, number one, who's self-deceived. And at the moment they think that, guess what? Their spiritual progress has stopped. They've stopped. They've stopped growing. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, self-satisfaction is the grave of progress. He who thinks himself perfect is never likely to be so. Wow. Self-satisfaction is the grave of progress. You want to bury your spiritual life? Then think that you're all that in a bag of chips and that'll do it. You know what I'm saying? Warren Wearsby wrote this. A divine dissatisfaction is essential for spiritual progress. And he's right, and that's what Paul is saying here. Listen, it was Paul's divine dissatisfaction that propelled him forward in his relationship with Christ. It was that very dissatisfaction that caused him to want more of Christ. See? If you would, look what he says in verse 12. Look at verse 12. After he says, I've not, you know, I haven't already attained and, or am I already perfected? He says, but what? But I press on. Do you see that? He goes, I move forward. The King James here actually reads it this way. It says, I follow after. Literally what it means, to make it simple, is it means to pursue. Paul's like, I keep on pressing on. I keep pursuing something. Now, the Greek verb here literally means to run swiftly, to catch a person or a thing. That's what the word press on here means. To run swiftly, to catch a person or a thing. And that word was applied a few different ways, and I want to share them with you because it's pertinent to our study. First, the Greeks used this Greek word that's translated press on here. They used it to describe a hunter eagerly, Pursuing his prey. A hunter who is right on the tracks of his prey. And he's following him closely. He's pursuing him. And it's interesting because Paul used this same word up in verse 6 to describe his zeal for the Lord. Look at verse 6. He wrote in verse 6, concerning zeal, what's he say? Persecuting the church. See the word persecuting there? 
The word that's translated persecuted there is the same Greek word that is translated in this verse, press on. See? In other words, before he knew Christ, Paul persecuted or followed after Christians like a hunter pursuing his prey. I mean, you could read that back in Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9. He made havoc of the church, dragging off believers out of their houses to prison. Chapter 9 says he was still breathing threats upon the church. That's why he went and got letters from the, from the priests to go to Damascus to arrest more Christians. I mean, Saul was hunting them down like a hunter hunts his prey. But now, what's he doing? Now, after he's come to the knowledge of Christ, now he presses on or follows, not Christians, but Christ. You see that? What Paul is saying here, by using this particular Greek word in these verses, in verse 6 and then again in verse 12, and he'll use it again in verse 14, what he's saying is this. The same zeal and energy that he employed to persecute the church, he's now using in following Christ. See that? He's just took that same energy, and now it has a different focus. Listen, Paul was a great sinner. He tells us that in the New Testament. Paul was a great sinner, but guess what? He was a greater saint. He was a greater servant of Jesus. In fact, if you would, I want you to turn your Bibles with me. Hold your place here. Hold your place here in Philippians 3. Turn with me over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And come down to verse 12. Paul writes and says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. That's the Apostle Paul. But he says, Before that, I was Saul. See? And what's he say? Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent, that means a violent man. He says, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And notice this, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. He goes on to say, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and here it is, of who I am chief. Right? However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ, notice this, might show all long suffering. As a pattern to those who are going to believe on Him for everlasting life. Do you see that? Paul states that Christ saved him as sinful as he was in order to use him as a pattern or as an example to and for all believers. Okay? So though Christ is our ultimate example, Paul says Christ has chosen me, did what he did in my life in order to provide a pattern for you to follow. This is why Paul would say in his letters a few times, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Okay? So this is interesting. Because even though Paul was a great sinner, he was a greater saint and a greater servant. 
But I fear that for too many Christians today, we actually were better sinners than we are saints. You know, there's a lot of Christians, and there may be some in this church, that you were a lot better sinner than you, were, than you are a saint. You were great sinners, but you're terrible Christians. Okay? How can I dare say that? Because it's true. Listen, for many Christians, when they were lost, and this may be you, listen, there was no limit to the money, to the time, and to the energy that they would put into their sin. I know this personally because my mother was one of those people. Spent countless money, time, and energy in her sin. But thank God she came to Christ. And now at, what, 72 years old, she's serving her heart out for Jesus at Calvary Chapel in Cincinnati. In fact, my mom told me she just just was made the leader over the greeter team at her church at 72 years old. I am so proud of her. I am so glad for what the Lord has done in her life. It's pretty amazing. But you know what? For a lot of Christians, there's no limit to how much time, money, time, and energy they spend on sin. But now that they're a Christian, guess what? Their money, their time, and their energy all of a sudden now have to be, has to be conserved. Well, I got to be careful how much money I spend giving to the Lord. I got to be careful how much time I give to the church and that I serve Jesus. I have to be careful with how much energy I put into serving the Lord because, you know, I don't want to burn out and I don't want to get tired. I need me time. You know how many Christians think that way? A lot. A lot of Christians think that way. Life, all of a sudden now, all of these things, all these resources now have to be conserved for themselves for some reason. When it used to be spent on their sin. See, what should happen now is we should be like Paul. We should be spending it on our Savior. See, that's the point. Some Christians were better at sinning then they aren't serving. And that's a sad thing. In fact, I heard the story of one guy who hadn't been to church in a long time. He finally made it out to church one Easter. As he was leaving the church afterwards, the pastor grabbed him by the hand, pulled him aside and said to him, he said, Son, you really need to join the army of the Lord. The man replied, I'm already in the army of the Lord, Pastor. The pastor questioned, how come I never see you except at Christmas and Easter? He whispered back to the pastor. He said, I'm in the secret service. (laughs) Listen, today as a believer, if you're in the secret service, would you please resign? Please resign and come into the real service that Jesus deserves for saving your poor soul. See? That's what Paul did. Some Christians, again, were better at sinning than they are at serving. But not Paul. And Paul is our pattern. See? Listen. As a pastor, I am to be an example to you of a believer, okay, and a follower of Christ. And part of my calling is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. But listen, even I'm not your pattern. See, Jesus is your ultimate pattern. And after that, Paul is. I look at Paul and go, I want to be more like that. See, never forget that. The same zeal and energy that he used to sin against Christ, he now used to serve Christ. Okay? 
So turn back with me now to Philippians 3. And as we bring things to a close, I want to make another application here for the words press on. There's another application. And that application has to do with athletics. It has to do with athletics. Now, when you read Paul's letters in the New Testament, it's easy to come to the conclusion that Paul was a sports fan. Have you noticed that? If you read through his New Testament letters, you will see that Paul used a lot of athletic analogies in his writings. I mean, he talks about foot racing. He talks, as, he's, as he does here, he talks about boxing. He talks about wrestling. There's a lot of different sports that Paul brings up to use as analogies. And here in our text, Paul describes the believer as an athlete competing in a foot race pushing toward the finish line. That's the picture here. So from here on out, that's what we're going to be discussing as we pick this up next week. We're going to be, that's going to be our theme as we go through the rest of these verses. So, see the, again, that those words press on? That Greek verb refers to, to just that. It refers to an athlete competing in a foot race, pushing himself toward the finish line. He's the one who runs swiftly in a race in order to reach a goal. And that's the language Paul is now using here. Okay? What's interesting is he uses the same verb in verse 14 to communicate that very idea. Look at verse 14. Paul writes and says, I press toward. There it is again, same verb. I press toward what? The goal. Why? For the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We'll break that down for you next week. And what was the goal that Paul was running swiftly to reach? What was his goal? Well, notice he goes on to say, Here in verse 12, look what he says. He says, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Do you see that? In other words, Jesus first laid hold of Paul. Why? So Paul could in return lay hold of him. See? What is... What is the goal Paul's trying to reach? Christ-likeness. Jesus laid hold of him so that he could lay hold of him. Christ. Now, Greek scholar Kenneth Wiest describes the Greek verb, this Greek verb translated lay hold of, this way. He says it's like a football player who not only wants to catch his man, but he wants to pull him down. In other words, tackle him from behind and make him his own. I love that imagery. That's the picture here of those words, to lay hold of. See? That's what Christ did to Paul, didn't he? Yeah, Christ pursued Paul until he caught him on the road to Damascus. And what did he do? He made him his own. He said, boy, you're mine now, right? As Jesus appeared to him, boom, Paul hit the ground. Guess what? Play over. Jesus now says, Paul, you're my servant. You're my son. I'm going to make you an apostle to the Gentiles. I'm going to have you to speak before kings the Gentiles, and the people of Israel, see. Well, because that happened to Paul, now Paul is pursuing Christ in order to know him and to become like him, see. He wants to lay hold of Christ's likeness. He wants to pull it down and make it his own. 
That's what the word literally means. Paul wants to know Christ. He wants to pull him down into his life to where his life becomes like Christ's. Wow. See, Paul's goal was the perfection of Christ or the Christ-likeness. See, that's what Paul was after. In fact, Paul put it this way in Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. He said, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through His grace, why did God do that? Paul says, listen, to reveal His Son in me that I might preach among the Gentiles, or I might preach Him among the Gentiles. Paul said the whole reason God called me was to preach, yes. But through everything that I do for him, that he might reveal Jesus in me. See, that's what Paul was after, Christ's likeness. In fact, referring to those who are the called according to his purpose. You know that phrase? Huh? Where's it from? Romans 8, 28. Referring to those who are the called according to his purpose, Paul wrote this in the next verse, Romans 8, 29. He says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. That means God has chosen beforehand for them to be conformed into the image of his Son. Isn't that amazing? Why did Christ call to you? Why did God draw you to His Son? He knew you. And in spite of that, He loved you. He chose you. And He called you and brought you to His Son for this purpose. That you might become like Christ that you might be conformed to the image of Jesus. God wasn't interested in just forgiving your sins so you can go to heaven one day and then the rest of your time on earth, you just live the way you want, serve yourself, get the most you can out of this world and go to heaven one day. That God did not save you for that. God did not save you to sin. He saved you to serve Him, and to become like Jesus. See, that's the goal, not only for Paul, but that's the goal for every Christian. That's, that's why Paul wrote back in verse 10. Go back to verse 10. That's why Paul wrote this, that I may know Him. See, Paul, Paul goes, my biggest ambition in life now as a believer is to know Christ, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And what's the purpose? Being what? Conformed. There it is again. Being conformed to his death. Now, as I shared a few studies ago, the word conformed here means the same thing as it does in Romans 8, 29. It means to bring one to the same form with some other person. And for Paul, that other person was Christ. And for us, as believers, it's the same. Paul's the pattern, okay? And God's desire is the same. He, has, he knew us, he called us, he chose us for us to be conformed to the image of Jesus, to become like Christ. See? After Paul came to the knowledge of Christ, his desire was to know Him in order that he might become more like Him. And as I close, I want to read this verse to you. I want to read this verse to you in the New Living Translation because it puts it perfectly. It says this. Paul says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But... I press on to possess that 
perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. As you sit here today as a believer, let me ask you a question. Is that your ambition? Because for Paul, it was all of life. Remember what Paul said in Philippians 1.21? For, for to me, to live is Christ. Guys, that's our pattern. That should be the desire of our heart as well if we're truly born again. And if it's not, then something is wrong in our relationship with God. And we need to repent, we need to confess, and we need to allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse us from all filthiness of flesh and spirit so that we can be perfect in holiness so that He can perfect us and make us more like Jesus. That's the point. So the what here, the goal, the what for Paul was Christ's likeness. Now next week we're going to pick up in verse 13 and we're going to look at the how. How was Paul working towards that? What was Paul doing to bring that up? about in his life. And so we're going to look at that next week as we finish this section.